Hello and welcome to the webinar, Regulations and Technology Considerations for Heavy Duty Zero Emission Vehicles, co-hosted by ACT News and the Port of San Diego. My name is Patrick Couch and I'm Senior Vice President and Partner at Gladstein Neandros and Associates, a renewable energy consulting firm in Santa Monica, California. And I'm looking forward to both moderating as well as providing some content uh, for today's webinar. This webinar will explore upcoming regulatory requirements for drage fleets and pathways to remain in compliance. It also provides an overview of zero emission technologies, including but not limited to range, weight, recharging time, and costs associated with those technologies. Uh, today, we'll be hearing first from Sean Coca, our Director of Regulatory Compliance at GNA, and myself, uh, and I will lead the technology discussion. Uh, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items I'd like to uh, to go through. Um, first, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the webinar. And if you're listening live and have questions, I encourage you to submit them by using the Q&A box located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Some of the information that will sh be shared today is technical, technical. So you'll likely want to watch it again. And an email with a link to the webinar recording will be sent out uh, by early next week. Um, so with that, Sean, if you're ready, I'd like to switch over and hand off the presentation to you to go over some of the regulatory uh, issues affecting uh, the drage uh, truck market today. Absolutely. Thanks, Patrick, and welcome everybody to the webinar. Again, my name is Sean Coca. I'm the Director of Compliance here at GNA, and I want to take some time to go over um, the drage-specific portion of the advanced clean fleet proposed rule um, that is that the California Air Resources Board is considering. Now, the uh, the advanced clean fleet or ACF rule is a rule that is pushing the transition across um, several different sectors of the transportation industry in California. It is pushing the adoption of zero emission vehicles. And those zero emission vehicles, as far as CARB is concerned, they are your battery electric vehicles and your hydrogen powered vehicles. Now, there are different, there are different rules for different sectors of the, um, of the transportation market. Right now, we're gonna talk about the drayage market, the drayage portion of this rule. Um, the drayage portion of the rule, and they consider drayage, I should, I should start with this. The drayage um, sector is what CARB considers any vehicle that regularly goes to regulated seaports, rail yards, or any other port of entry and um, picks up bulk material from that seaport and then moves it to another location. So the focus of the drayage part of this rule is entirely on class seven and class eight vehicles. And the, uh, the the purpose of the rule, as I said, is to transition those currently diesel and perhaps even uh, natural gas or internal combustion engine vehicles to a zero emission equivalent over time. As uh, opposed to the other part or, or, con or contrary to the other rules um, within the uh, advanced clean fleet rule, the drayage portion of the rule is entirely enforced by the drayage truck registry. And if you are a drayage truck driver or operator, you're probably familiar with the drayage truck registry. Um, in entering any port of entry, any seaport, any um, rail yard, uh, if you are not on and registered with the DTR, you will not be allowed in. Now, how the, how the ACF plans on utilizing the DTR as an enforcement mechanism is starting, according to the latest uh, language in the rule, starting in 2024, January 1, 2024, all new registrants to the DTR must be zero emission. Um, existing vehicles that, uh, existing internal combustion engine vehicles, diesel, natural gas, um, that are already in the DTR uh, will be grandfathered in up until 2035. Um, at which point everything in the DTR would be required to be zero emission. Next slide. Now, as I said, the mechanism for enforcement of this rule is the drage truck registry itself. Um, in order to get into the ports, you need to be in that registry. And if you don't conform to either the zero emission standard or um, the, the uh, legacy truck standard, 
uh, you won't be allowed in the port or the rail yard or the other otherwise the port of entry. Um, to maintain your status, so say you have a uh, internal combustion engine vehicle and you visit you visit the port regularly. To maintain your status as a legacy truck up to that 2035 um, uh, deadline, you need to be sure that those trucks visit the port at least once a year. This means that if you have uh, backup trucks that you send every once in a while, or they're just backup for when trucks break down, um, part of uh, the operational aspect of that is you need to make sure that those trucks get to the port at least once a year. Otherwise, they will be removed from the drage truck registry and you won't be able to utilize them in, in a drage capacity. Um, once that vehicle reaches 13 engine model years old, so if it's a 2010 engine, starting this year in 2023, uh, those vehicles will have to uh, conduct annual reporting of their mileage because the useful life of the vehicle will determine when that vehicle needs to be removed from the drage truck registry. Now, the useful life is a California, uh, it's, a, it's a California law, it's based on a 2007 law, Senate Bill 1, that, in, that defined the useful life of a vehicle as either 18 years or 800,000 miles. Um, and once the vehicle reaches either one of those milestones, um, the useful life has, has passed of that vehicle and the state can then force you to remove it, repower it, or otherwise just get it out of your, your, your fleet in California. So those vehicles that have gone, um, that have, uh, that are older than 13 years will have to report on their annual mileage to ensure that they are following the, the, uh, the useful life rules of the advanced clean fleet rule. Um, any vehicle that, like I said, that has gone over its, its uh, mileage or that has uh, gone beyond 18 model years, uh, that vehicle will be removed from the drainage truck registry. Now there is no, there is no uh, requirement that you purchase a new vehicle to replace that uh, that other vehicle that was removed from the drage truck registry. But um, the understanding is if a vehicle is removed, you as an operator will likely want to replace that vehicle to continue your business. And any new vehicle that is added will need to be a zero emission vehicle. So like I said, there is no there is no mandate that you purchase vehicles, but in order to continue your operation, you would need to purchase a vehicle, continue your operation in, in a, the same or a similar manner. Next slide. There are a few exemptions to the rule. Um, like I said, this is mainly a rule that is focused on bulk, uh, bulk material shipment, um, goods shipment. So dedicated use vehicles are, are exempt from the rule. These are unibody vehicles. Um, they don't have separate tractor and trailers. Uh, things like auto transport vehicles, uh, fuel vehicles, concrete mixers, uh, cranes, and vehicles that require power takeoff units to operate. So those those vehicles are um, are exempt from the rule. Emergency vehicles, military tactical support, and other vehicles that are subject to other um, regulations, such as the mobile cargo handling equipment regulation. Um, if they're subject to another rule, they, they wouldn't be subject to this and they wouldn't have to abide by it. Next slide. Now you might think, okay, um, I've got time. I've got a, uh, I've, uh, I've got a fairly new truck. I don't have to worry about this rule as long as I visit the port uh, once a year, at least once a year, uh, I'll be able to, I'll be able to uh, utilize it as a legacy truck. Um, but there is really, there, there are a few things that you need to consider. Um, one is the mileage. And uh, the chart that you're looking at right now shows uh, some estimates on engine model year and um, the date that the vehicle will exceed 800,000 miles. Um, and based on average usage, and this is average usage that is uh, that was uh, used to, to draft the rule, so about 248 miles a day, operating five days a week, um, you actually will run into 800,000 miles a few years before, at least four years before uh, the vehicle actually turns 18 years. So the timeline might be crunched. Now, there are other, uh, there are other 
factors that might play into the uh, early retirement of these vehicles. That one being um, if the vehicle was used for something else before it became a drage vehicle and the mileage is, is uh, increased. Um, this is going off of a zero. This is a, assuming that the vehicle was brand new in 2010 and was only used for drage. If it was used or, or if it is used um, for other purposes other than drayage, uh, these uh, these years could be far earlier. They could be 2020. I mean, 2020. It's it, it it essentially could be vehicles that have already exceeded their useful life when it comes to the port, depending on the usage. So, it's important to note your your average usage and really plot out the um, the timelines for your vehicle's useful life because. Uh, as I said, once it hits that milestone where it's 13 years uh, old, you're you're going to have to start reporting on it. And the uh, as you can see, the first three years of this, so model year 2010, 2011, and 2012, starting in 2025, when this rule, when the implementation of this rule begins, that's when the first reporting date is for those three model years. Um, if the vehicles are close or even over. Uh, the mileage at that point, then you will have to remove them from your fleet. So it's important to note when these when these uh, deadlines and uh, will occur and and how they're going to affect the um, the trucks in your fleet. Now, if you have uh, this is again just for trucks that visit the drayage ports, and railheads, and, and ports of entry. Um, other vehicles are subject to different rules, so this is just concerning these drayage trucks. Next slide. Now there are a few exemptions to the rule or extensions, I should say. Um, the CARB has recognized that there are things beyond the control of a uh, fleet operator. And these extensions will allow for additional time to comply with the rule or additional life for a vehicle. So one is the vehicle delivery delay. Now that is if a um, delay occurs that are that is beyond your control, something that is a manufacturer delay, uh, supply chain delay. You've ordered the vehicle and it just hasn't arrived. There's some there's some um, delay in parts or assembly or some other way. And this is for zero emission vehicles. Um, you can apply for and be granted an extension. And what that would do would extend the life of your otherwise uh, fired um, vehicle, the one that has gone beyond its useful life and would allow you to keep utilizing that vehicle until the new one is delivered. Now, there is a process that needs to, a uh, reporting process that needs to be done. Um, the documentation needs to be submitted from the manufacturer and um, uh, documenting what the issue is, uh, but there are allowances for that. Additionally, there are a few infrastructure delay um, extensions as well. And this is similar to other parts of the rule where there is an actual construction delay that uh, is designed for the actual construction of the charging or fueling infrastructure. If any of that is delayed um, through the the physical construction process, maybe your general contractor changed, or um, there is a CEQA um, environmental concern that is brought up by authorities. If anything like that happens, there is a process to apply for an extension um, to install those, those uh, infrastructure pieces. Additionally, if there is a delay in getting power to the site through the utility, through um, the local utility, if new power lines need to be added, if new um, load needs to be added to the grid, if, if uh, infrastructure, if, if utility infrastructure needs to be constructed to support the operation of those vehicles, then, um, and that takes longer than expected for any number of reasons, um, there's a delay that can be applied for and, um, and utilized to, again, keep utilizing some of those vehicles that are that are beyond their useful life. Now there's an entire process and it's still being, um, again, this rule is still being in, uh, developed, um, but uh, there is going to be a reporting process that is utilized to um, apply for and qualify for these exempt or these extensions. Next slide. Um, I should note that the uh, rule itself is being considered by CARB uh, 
starting in April, or it's it's beginning. I should. The rule itself is being considered by CARB in their April meeting, which I believe is April 27th and 28th. This is the second meeting of CARB to consider this rule, and this is the meeting where uh, where adoption is expected. Um, that doesn't mean the rule will go into effect immediately. Uh, the rule still needs to be approved by the Office of Administrative Law, which will probably happen in the summer. That's the expectation. Um, so barring any um, barring any legal challenges or successful legal challenges, the first implementation date of this rule is January 1st, 2024. That doesn't allow for a lot of time to begin complying with or begin planning to comply with this rule if those plans haven't already been started. So things like contacting your, your utility to inquire about, um, to inquire about uh, uh, capacity and uh, engaging with zero emission vehicle manufacturers and, and producers to, to get orders in and to start that whole process. Um, for, for things like the extension and things um, like complying with the rule, really what you need to do is show a, a, a good faith effort to comply with the rule in order to qualify for anything, extensions, exemptions, um, any kind of consideration. So starting those processes early, and in many cases, it needs to be at least a year before the compliance date. And we're already beyond that when it comes to the actual implementation of this rule. Now, when vehicles need to be taken out of, um, when they need to be taken out of service because they're beyond their useful life, that could vary the date. But starting early is the key. Starting now, starting yesterday um, would be ideal, but starting now, if you haven't already, is something that you need to do and you need to engage with all of those affected or all of those parties, all those manufacturers and suppliers in order to get um, you, yourself, your company and your drivers prepared for this rule. Um, now that's all I had. Uh, we are going to move on, uh, we'll move back to Patrick to discuss the, um, the technical side of this. Great, <clears throat> thanks, Sean. Um, and I, I can't emphasize enough what Sean said. If you're looking at a truck today and it's a model year 10, 11, or 12, and you think you're getting close to 800,000 miles, um, you are rapidly running out of time to uh, have that truck continue to uh, perform drainage service. Uh, so it's either going to have to be removed uh, or replaced in the fleet, and your only option is going to be zero emission. Uh, and so what we want to do in the second half of the presentation today is talk a bit about what some of your zero emission options are and really try to give you some very practical perspectives on what these trucks can and can't do today, um, what some of your options are, give you some indicative costs so you can start thinking about um, what, the, what the cost equation might be for you. Um, this is to get you started, and nothing's going to replace actually engaging all of those um, dealers and manufacturers and others that Sean mentioned to really develop your specific plan. Uh, but hopefully this gives you a good starting point as you go into those discussions and can start uh, thinking about what resources you need uh, to access. So let's go ahead and flip to the next slide. Uh, so. I want to start the discussion off today with some uh, an overview of some of the most common uh, battery electric truck options today for Class 8 uh, uh, semi-tractors. Next slide. So here you see the majority of the EV platforms that are available out there. There's a couple of others that aren't on this list. Uh, I simply couldn't fit them on the slide, um, but but these are a number of the major ones out there. Um, and you have some of your major manufacturers like Freightliner and Volvo that, that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and then you have some of the, the newer entrants into uh, the Class 8 uh, on-road market in the North America, which are going to be BYD, Lion, Nikola is on that list as well. Um, and what you see here are the specs. These are the, the specs for their essentially the longest range option currently offered for each of these uh, platforms. Uh, their wheel base and their curb weights estimated wherever possible. Um, next click, please. So what I want to highlight to start with is this 
kilowatt hour rating. This is how much energy the battery pack can store for each one of these trucks. And this translates to a maximum daily range. Next click. And so how do you make that translation from kilowatt hours to range? Well, you need to use a form of fuel economy that in EV terms, we're thinking in terms of kilowatt hours per mile. How many kilowatt hours does it take to move that vehicle one mile? Uh, as a rough guide, you can think of two kilowatt hours per mile as a pretty typical number for a class eight dredge truck. Um, it will depend on duty cycle and a lot of other factors, but two kilowatt hours per mile is a good starting point. And if you do that and you go through and you divide all of these battery pack capacities by two, you'll get the maximum range. This is the range the truck could travel if you uh, started 100% of charge and fully depleted it. Next click. Uh, but manufacturers generally don't recommend that you do that. Not only does it accelerate wear uh, and degradation on the battery, operationally, uh, there's no level of comfort continually planning to run your truck all the way down to zero. Charging it to 100% extends charging times, um, and the truck can start to derate its performance when the state of charge gets too low. So it, realistically, you want to think about maybe running that truck between, say, 15% and 90% uh, state of charge. That's where you want to keep the truck operating most of the time. And so that really means you got about 75% of that maximum capacity as a regular daily usable capacity um, when the truck is new. And when you take the max range and multiply by 75%, you get this second line in terms of what you could expect from a, a typical uh, uh, daily range for the truck when it's new. Next click. Now, the battery will degrade over time. And if you're doing good things like keeping the battery in that 15 to 90% uh, charge range, you're trying to charge it sort of overnight whenever you can, rather than always uh, charging it as fast as possible, you're going to minimize that degradation. Uh, but you will still expect that by the end of the useful life, if that pack lasts the entire life of the truck, um, you're going to have less capacity than when you started. And so if we assume that you have about 80% of the original capacity available to you at the end of your life of the truck, that means that over time, as that truck gets older, you're going to get these these uh, this last row of mileages as your maximum range. So you're looking at the end of useful life on these trucks, uh, somewhere between 120 and, and 200 miles of useful range. When they're new, you're looking at something uh, in the neighborhood of about 150 to 250 miles of range. And one of the other things you'll see here is that that range generally correlates with increasing weight of the vehicle. The curb weight increases as we have bigger battery packs. So you can get longer range, but you're going to have to manage a higher vehicle weight. Uh, next slide. So what does that higher vehicle weight mean, right? So if we think about an EV tractor that typically weighs between 22 and 28,000 pounds uh, curb weight, and notionally you can think of a diesel tractor as maybe 17 to 18,000 pound curb weight, so these are several thousand pounds heavier. Um, you can create a chart like the one we have on the on the side here on the on the screen that shows the trade-off between incremental weight, curb weight on the bottom there, and what your payload capacity is. Now this payload capacity includes the weight of the trailer. Uh, and if we uh, also recognize that battery electric trucks are granted a 2,000 pound weight exemption, which means the truck can actually run at 82,000 pounds max. That, we want to account for all these things as we step through an example here to think about what that curb weight impact really is. So let's, let's assume we have a truck that's got 23,500 pound curb weight. Uh, next click. Uh, so the max cargo weight for 23,000 pound uh, vehicles, uh, 45,000 pounds, and you can read that off the chart. Next click. Uh, but the max container weight's 38,000 pounds if you make an assumption that the trailer uh, has about a 7,000 pound uh, 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 tear weight. Next click. 
Now you get to add back in 2,000 pounds because of that uh, weight exemption that I mentioned. So that really means that for a electric truck with a 23,500 pound curb weight, you can haul up to about 40,000 pound containers or 40,000 pounds of cargo, excluding the, the trailer weight. Next slide, or next click. Uh, now, how does that compare versus a diesel? Well, a diesel with its 18,000 pound curb weight is gonna really allow you to haul about 49,000 pounds for containers. Most containers don't come in weighing that much, uh, so you have a lot more flexibility with the diesel. The electric's still capable of hauling a lot of the containers out there, um, but you have to keep in mind that um, if you're, for example, a container hauler, um, thinking about what fraction of your uh, your work might result in pushing you over overweight, how many of your containers are going to be over forty thousand, and potentially prioritize some of the lighter weight electric trucks um, and and manage that trade off in range. Next slide. So th those are the two key questions we always get uh, about electric trucks from a performance perspective. What's their range and how much do they weigh? Those are two of the biggest operational impacts. The next question is always, from an operational perspective, how do I think about charging, right? I understand diesel fueling, charging is totally new to me. So what I'd like to do is go through a few slides here to talk a little bit about charging at a, at a high level and recommend a couple of resources that'll uh, give you a chance to really um, get more engaged and, and more up to speed on some of the important terminology and concepts in, uh, in when we're talking about charging. Next slide. So charging 101, right? So diesel fueling makes sense to fleets. This is what you deal with on a regular basis. The, the volumes are communicated in units that you understand, like gallons. Fueling times are generally consistent, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes. There's not a lot of variability there. But when we start talking about EVs, not only are the performance uh, metrics different, the basic units of measure, like kilowatt hours and kilowatts, are different. And these are not terms that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, we also have to remember that fleets today have evolved around diesel fueling, where price is independent of how fast and when you fuel. Um, electricity, by contrast, is very dependent in terms of price on when and how fast you fuel. And so you need to start thinking about when do I fuel my fleet and how long does that take uh, when you when you transition to electric. We also are in a time where EV charging standards are evolving. The market's kind of settled around uh, one particular standard, but even that standard is evolving to provide higher power, faster charging. So there's uh, this, uh, this evolving landscape that has to be um, considered. And then of course, as you know, as a fleet, fleets are not static. Customers and requirements change over time, right? Uh, and so making sure that the charging strategies and the vehicle capabilities that are being spec'd continue to allow flexibility so that you're not locked into a single limited type of operation is, is a very important consideration. Next slide. So just at a very high level, the basic anatomy of getting power from the street to your vehicle is gonna involve these various pieces, right? So from the power line, that line's gonna come down, it's gonna to connect to a transformer, very often on the pole or on your property. There's gonna be a utility meter, the meter's that electricity. The electricity is then gonna to go to a switch gear or an electrical panel where all the electricity is distributed to different circuits. For EV charging, some of that electricity is gonna to run to a parking stall or a fueling lane um, and then supply a charger. And that charger is ultimately going to be the device that plugs in your vehicle. And so you need to think about this entire supply chain from the street to your vehicle and who owns what portions of that infrastructure. Um, the utility, it owns and is responsible for the infrastructure from the power line to the meter, what we call the utility side infrastructure. 
the property owner is responsible for the infrastructure from the meter all the way to the charger. That's the customer side infrastructure. And keeping those terms in mind is important because we see different incentive programs and other things evolving around the separation of utility owned versus customer owned uh, infrastructure. Next slide. So I want to throw a little bit of charging terminology out at you here, um, just because I feel like it's very difficult to engage in conversations with your suppliers and others if you don't understand the phrases that are being used. Um, so one of the most common phrases you're going to hear, and you've already seen it once in this presentation, is kilowatt hour. Right? Kilowatt hour is a unit of electrical energy. It measures a certain amount of electrical energy. When you're trying to understand it conceptually, you can think about it in a certain number of kilowatt hours has a, a certain amount of energy the same way that a gallon of fuel has a certain amount of energy. So you can, when people are talking about kilowatt hours with EVs, you can think about it almost like asking how big the fuel tank is, how many gallons of fuel you have. Um, the second one that sounds a lot like the first one and confuses people is kilowatt. Kilowatt is a measure of electrical power. It's describing how fast you deliver that electrical energy. Not how much energy, but how fast you push it through. So conceptually, that's similar to talking about the gallons per minute of your pump, right? It's not uh, how many gallons your pump delivered, it's how many gallons per minute it pushed, right? So um, those, are the, those are two very, very important terms that you'll hear over and over again. They sound a lot alike, um, they are related, but uh, one is, a quantity a unit volume and the other one is uh, is a flow rate. The next term you're going to hear uh, is electric vehicle supply equipment or EVSE. This is kind of a broad term that talks about all different types of chargers whether that's a DC fast charger or a level 2 AC charger or whatever these different types of chargers they're all generally classified as EVSE and the charger is you know, conceptually the same as a fuel pump or a fuel dispenser. Um, the next term you're gonna hear uh, very commonly in the heavy duty space is combined charging standard or CCS1. This is the North American uh, standard for um, DC fast charges, the most common plug out there for charging heavy duty class eight electric trucks. Um, conceptually, you can think of it like a USB-C plug. Everybody knows what a USB-C plug is. If you have a device that can use that plug, it'll fit, it should communicate and charge just fine. The same concept applies here with the CCS1 plug. Trucks that have CCS1 plugs should all connect and should be able to communicate and charge um, with some caveats, which I'll get into in a little bit, but conceptually it's a standardized plug and communication interface. Um, the last two terms I wanted to touch on quickly are utility related terms, time of use and demand charge. So time of use is basically a utility structure where you have to pay um, a fee depending on when you take energy, when you take electricity. Um, you can think of it like surge or congestion pricing, right? If you're taking electricity during certain times of day when that electricity is expensive, usually because everybody wants that electricity at that time, um, you're going to have to pay more for it. And then demand charge is a fee that's charged by the utility for the maximum kilowatts you use, right? It's essentially charging you for how fast you uh, you take your energy. So you can think of this kind of like paying for faster internet service. Even if you don't always use the maximum capability of that internet connection, you're still paying a fee to have the ability to use that maximum speed when you do use it. Uh, next slide. So there's a lot more to go through, a lot more concepts, a lot more terminology. Uh, one resource I would really encourage you to consider looking at is the sdg e Power Your Drive fleet page, and the link is, is here. There are fleet electrification program explainers, rebate and EV plan information, uh, fact sheets on zero emission regulations like the ACF, um, and importantly, this EV charging guidebook. Next slide. 
So the EV charging guidebook uh, is really intended to provide more of this charging 101 for fleet operators. It really focuses on medium and heavy duty commercial fleets. And it walks you through a number of, uh, of sections and examples on how to estimate fleet energy usage and charging time requirements, understanding the different uh, charging options out there, uh, looking for configurations that make sense for you. It's it's really a very good resource. It also walks you through understanding uh, some basic utility bill type calculations, um, and it's just a just a good uh, resource to to read and have in your back pocket when you don't remember uh, some of the some of the terms that are being thrown around. Next slide. Um, now, with all that said, I want to boil down a few key recommendations here when you're thinking about EV charging. Um, first of all, number one recommendation, you need to understand your daily use. And by that, I mean, think about how you use your trucks. What's your average and peak mileage? When do those trucks dwell? You know, how long do they park overnight? Where do they park overnight? What are your maximum cargo weights? Because all of these things are important to thinking about where you put infrastructure, how much energy how big a battery pack you need to have, um, when you can charge it, which will influence uh, your, your charging infrastructure uh, solutions. Um, if possible, I am a big believer in trying to demonstrate an EV in your fleet. There's nothing quite as informative as actually operating a unit for a couple of weeks, a month, understand how that unit fits in your fleet, how your drivers react to it, uh, what it really looks like to do charging. Um, so if that's possible, that's very high on the recommendation list. Um, when you get to planning your infrastructure, it is one of the best ways to reduce or manage costs is to try to maximize the utilization of that infrastructure. If you overbuild a lot of infrastructure or you try to plan to charge your fleet all in one hour, when you have six or seven hours available to do it, that's going to create very expensive infrastructure. You want to look at how can I keep that infrastructure pumping electrons as long as possible because that's going to um, reduce the amount of infrastructure and reduce your electricity costs um, on a, at least relative to the amount of energy you consume. So make sure that you think about how do I keep that that infrastructure utilized. The same way that you think about how do I keep my trucks uh, running every day. Um, charging speeds are going to be limited by the slowest link in the chain. And it's critical that you know what performance to expect from your particular vehicle and infrastructure combination uh, so that you don't find yourself with chargers that perform more faster than the trucks you, you purchased or vice versa. And, and you find that you're not getting the uh, performance that you expected. Now, I talked about CCS1 as the de facto standard, and that's true. Uh, but one thing to understand is that different trucks can charge at different voltages um, over the CCS1 plug. And that voltage affects how much uh, energy and how much power your chargers can actually push into the truck. And it's possible to buy CCS1 chargers that can't charge some of the, um, the truck options out there because they don't deliver a high enough voltage. So very critical to, as you're working with your, uh, your vehicle manufacturer and your infrastructure supplier, to make sure that everybody syncs up around what do these trucks really require and what performance am I gonna get. And then the last thing, which kind of harkens back to one of the things Sean said is, you know, utility supply, uh, and getting grid access can have very long lead times. And we're running into these, uh, these pending deadlines on the rules. And what that means is you really, if you have those trucks that you're gonna have to start replacing uh, in the next couple of years, uh, you need to get started as soon as possible. Utility timelines can easily be two years to get electricity. Uh, and so, you know, if you think you're gonna have to make this change soon, in the next couple of years, you should be diving in now um, on the utility discussion as well. Next slide. Okay, so the last thing I wanna do is kind of quickly walk through some cost considerations. These are not hard and fast guaranteed numbers. 
but again, the intent here is to give you some uh, reasonable rough order of magnitude estimates to understand where you're starting from a cost perspective. Next slide. So the first thing I want to encourage you to do is think about your costs in a total cost of ownership uh, perspective. EVs are almost always more expensive upfront than diesel uh, when you're just looking at the, the capital outlay. Total cost of ownership looks at the total purchase cost and operating cost over the entire lifetime of the vehicle. And on a TCO basis, EVs can, they're not always, but they can be less expensive uh, than, than your diesel trucks. And so on the table here, we have a list of typical uh, cost elements, and I'll walk through some of these in the next few slides. Uh, but you can see the ones in green are where diesel tends to be better, are going to be on things like purchase uh, costs and infrastructure costs uh, and, and operating impacts. EVs are going to have lower fuel costs and maintenance costs, um, and they're going to qualify for various types of incentives that help um, reduce that TCO. Next slide. So let's just take these one at a time quickly here. Uh, purchase price, what's an e Class 8 EV typically gonna cost you? Today, before incentives, you're looking at probably 350 dollars to $450,000 pre-tax. When you add sales tax and, and federal excise tax on that, you're gonna add about 21% to the purchase price. Um, on the residual value side, you know, if you're leasing or financing these, they're gonna want to understand what's this asset going to be at the end of that loan or lease period. Um, the EV pricing is still very uncertain and some finance leasing companies will set that residual value to zero, uh, which increases your payments. Now it still may, it may make that vehicle a good buy for you at the end to keep um, if you have paid all of that off in the interim, but it does uh, in the short term increase your, your borrowing cost. Uh, infrastructure, if this is very sensitive to your charging uh, strategy and your site, um, but if you're looking at an overnight charger situation where you have maybe eight hours to recharge a, a vehicle, you're going to need about a 50 to 60 kilowatt charger, and that's going to cost you about 35 to 40 thousand dollars is a pretty typical starting point for a charger like that, uh, and your installation costs are probably going to be in the 40 to 75 thousand dollar range. Again. Very rough numbers, depends on scale, depends on site. Um, but if you're thinking about what's it gonna cost to put in a plug um, that can recharge one of these trucks overnight, this is roughly the range you're looking at. Next slide. So fuel costs. Um, electricity EVs can certainly be cheaper than diesel, um, especially when diesel's five or six dollars a gallon. Um, depending on when you charge and what utility rate you're on and how fast you charge and all of those things, you're looking at probably 15 to 30 cents per kilowatt hour as a realistic number. Um, working with the utility uh, to, to think about all of those factors and what EV rate programs are available is probably the best way to uh, get a, a more refined estimate of what your costs are likely to be. Now on maintenance, EVs generally are less expensive to maintain. They probably reduce maintenance costs by 25 to 50 percent, um, assuming that you don't have to replace the battery pack before the end of the vehicle life. Um, on insurance, typically what we see is that insurance costs go up because the replacement value of the electric vehicle is higher than the diesel, and so you, you have an increased insurance premium for that more expensive vehicle. Uh, as a rough starting point, you can think about maybe 3% of the incremental vehicle cost is going to be what your incremental insurance premium is uh, per year. Next slide. Uh, finally, on purchase incentives, this is where I think you get into more of the good news because a lot of what we just talked about was, was cost, right? Increased cost. There are very significant purchase incentives out there, and the next webinar that we have next week will delve uh, into specific details about those programs. But for example, the HVIP program, these trucks can qualify for $120,000 or more upfront uh, incentive, um, and there are federal tax credits that have been created that could be worth, say, $40,000. And so you start piecing these together, and that 
really starts uh, cutting away at that higher upfront purchase price. There are also carbon credits, primarily through what we call the Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program, and they're worth about eight to 10 cents a kilowatt hour. If you use that two kilowatt hour per mile number, you can think of it in maybe the 16 to 20 cent per mile range. And hopefully those will, will improve over time, but it's still a significant number to include in your, your calculations. Finally, the, the one that's harder to put a number on is the operational impact. Cargo weight, you're gonna have about a 20% reduction in maximum cargo weight. Does that matter to you? It depends on the cargo you haul. You're going to have charging times. Most trucks are gonna require two to four hours to recharge in most, most cases, um, if you're trying to recharge most of the battery pack. Um, does that matter to you? It depends. Are you running two shift trucks? What kind of flexibility do you have? So. Those are questions I can't answer for you specifically, but things that, that bear thinking about. Next slide. So finally, just to give you sort of boil that stuff down into something to, to think about, what you see on screen is an example of a TCO over 12 years uh, for a single shift truck that's running about 190 miles per day, is charging overnight. And what you see is that without incentives, the current battery electric truck offerings are almost twice as expensive on a total cost of ownership basis. But if you bring those incentives in, you can actually be at or below the total cost of ownership um, on your, on your uh, diesel vehicles. Next slide. So I, I wanna leave you with that message, uh, partly as a teaser and a, a, to, to talk about why it's important to, uh, to look at next week's webinar, which is gonna talk about incentives and what options are out there and how to access those. They are a critical part of um, really thinking about and, uh, and pursuing uh, a transition to a zero emission uh, drainage truck. All right, um, so that's the end of my presentation. I think at this point, we wanna go ahead and turn to our questions. Um, I have a few that look like they've popped in here. Um, Sean, it looks like the first one is for you. Um, okay. Uh, what if I only operate in drainage operations part of the time? How does that affect the uh, 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 obligations under the ACF rule? So for any drainage operation, um, for any operation that requires you to get into one of those ports, you need to comply with the drainage side of the rule. So those vehicles that are subject to the drainage part of the rule um, will have to uh, be in the drainage truck registry. In order to be in that registry, you need to either have that legacy ICE internal combustion engine vehicle visit the port at least once a year or have that vehicle be a new um, zero emission vehicle that's been added to the uh, registry after 2024. Um, there is a question about what if I have a multi-use fleet where uh, part of the fleet does, you know, your typical over the road um, uh, pickup and delivery of goods, and then another portion of my fleet does the drayage side of it. Now, um, the portion that goes to the drayage, to the, to the ports and to the, um, to the rail yards, that portion is subject to the to the uh, the drainage side, and then the other part that does your more typical over the road or or last mile type uh, pickup and delivery, that would be subject to a different part of the rule. So there is some there is some strategy that goes on or that that needs to be um, that needs to be done in how a fleet one organizes itself um, to ensure that it's very clear which trucks are the drainage trucks and which trucks are the um, the other ones that would be subject to say the high priority rule and um, and um, identifying those vehicles and, and, and ensuring that any vehicle that needs to go to the port is is um, conducting itself in a way that maintains its legacy status in the drage truck registry or um, that it isn't impacted by the useful life restrictions that are that are placed on the drainage truck side of that. And there are situations where a vehicle that is beyond its useful life, um, if you're on the high priority side, which would be you know, your typical private uh, over the road type um, uh, 
operation, if you're if you're subject to the high priority fleet side of it, uh, you can use a truck beyond its useful life in, in in some circumstances, and it won't it won't matter. So, being able to differentiate between those operations and being able to um, identify and set up processes to uh, to maintain the status of each of those vehicles um, in their respective sort of buckets um, is really important. It can't just be, and I know that this is sometimes the case when it comes to, um, to, to operations is you use whatever truck you have um, or you register all of them in the drainage truck registry so you can send any truck. Well, you need to be more strategic about that now because there are rules about or there will be rules about which trucks can go in or can be newly registered in the drainage truck registry that also affects you know like your procurement cycle and and what you're going to replace on a regular basis not not necessarily this truck is broken down i need a new one it's if you have a normal cycling of trucks where you buy new ones and sell old ones um some consideration might be uh needed to uh, to sort of reconfigure that that situation great thanks sean uh mm -hmm. we have a, another question here uh what would you say is the best use case for battery electric trucks today uh, as far as daily mileage and charging considerations uh you know the the offerings i think you could see based on the the range calculations uh i provided you really want to look for uh, operations that are probably in the 100 to 200 mile per day uh, or per shift category, right? The the range between uh, charging opportunities. So if you have a single shift truck that typically runs less than 200 miles per day, um, that should, from a, a technical fit perspective, be fairly doable. Um, you know, additionally, you'd like the that truck to domicile or, or come home and park at the same place every night so you can invest in infrastructure at that one location uh, rather than multiple locations. And if it has eight hours or so um, of available time to charge, that's going to let you use less expensive infrastructure and control your electricity costs um, and, and hopefully stretch the life, uh, useful life of that battery. So single shift trucks below 200 miles uh, in a sort of a return to base operation are fairly well within the capabilities and, and the sweet spot of battery electric today. As you push into two shift operations, you start getting up over about 250 or 300 miles per day, uh, that, that gets more challenging. Um, okay, Sean, one, one more thing on compliance here. How, how can I check if I'm in compliance and do I have to report anything before the trucks hit that, that 13 year threshold? Now there, there are, there are, um, there are annual reporting requirements that, that, like you said, kick in at the 13 years. But in terms of just general compliance, if you are familiar with um, the drayage side of things entering ports and, and rail yards and the, the drage truck registry you're, you're familiar with the arbor system um, that carb utilizes and arbor is is essentially where the drage truck registry lived and um and how you could essentially check uh whether your vehicle was registered and in, and in compliance um now that system has been sort of put on hold at least for drage trucks right now while this while this uh, rule is being um, considered and, and passed, but once it is passed, um, CARB is likely going to utilize a very similar system, if not the same system, to um, to, to uh, house the drainage truck registry again. And really, the compliance mechanism to know whether you're in compliance or not is whether or not you're in that system. Uh, because if you're not in the system, you won't be allowed access to the to the drainage site and you won't be able to enter, you won't be able to conduct your activities. And um, uh, that's really the, 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 the mechanism for, um, for ensuring compliance and enforcing compliance. Um, there, are, uh, there, there have been noted the, um, corrective actions that can, that can uh, be utilized by CARB. They have the ability to, um, to uh, suspend uh, 
registration, not suspend, but but keep registration from being renewed, uh, issuing monetary fines or, or other kind of corrective action. Um, they say sometimes like for, for larger companies to release press releases and, and do stories about um, offending parties who are, who are not in compliance. So um, all of those are on the table for uh, for carriers that are out of compliance with the rule that are that are trying to skirt, it's it's going to be difficult to not be in compliance with um, with the drayage side of it um, in reporting and in actually being um, compliant with the rule. Because, like I said, if you are not compliant with the rule, you won't be in the registry and you won't be able to access the ports of the rail yards, and and that sort of mechanism kind of weeds out the people or will weed out the people that aren't compliant with the rule. They just won't be able to conduct their business the way they have been. Great. Uh, one other question coming in here asking, it looks like about truck as a service offerings. Uh, so what, what are truck as a service offerings? Um, so you may, you may have heard this term. Uh, there's a, a couple of companies that are, are really pursuing uh, trucking as a service around electric trucks. Um, couple of examples, Watt EV, Forum Mobility. Um, these are uh, companies that essentially offer something that looks kind of like a full service lease for a truck, but almost always paired with that is going to be access to charging infrastructure and the, uh, the electricity being supplied as part of the agreement. So uh, the, the notion is that you can go to these companies, they will take care of the incentive uh, uh, aggregation and um, charger specking and building and, and provision of electricity and give you essentially a, uh, a monthly or a per mile or some, some basis price for the use of electric trucks, right? And so you're, you're just getting the truck as a service with all those other pieces uh, rolled into it. Um, there, there are new models that are, we're starting to see some of the, the sites and infrastructure built out uh, by those companies to, uh, to really uh, put this service into effect. Um, certainly is worth a consideration, uh, especially for um, fleets where the, you know, accessing the incentives or planning the infrastructure is, is daunting. Um, that might be a very good uh, initial um, way to try to try to get into some electric trucks and uh, would you know suggest that if you're curious that you reach out to some of those truck as a service providers to learn more about what their particular offering is and uh, geographically where they're currently offering services uh, and when they plan to build out into other regions. All right, I think we're coming up right on time here. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. So. Uh, we're just about out of time uh, and one thing I did want to mention here uh, is that we are offering free technical assistance on a first come first serve basis so if you've listened to this and your head's spinning a little bit or you have very specific questions about your fleet and you're trying to understand uh, what some of your options are uh, please consider using the QR code that's on the screen uh, to sign up and that will uh, give you an opportunity to uh, try to talk to one of our experts uh, whether that's um, on the technical side of things, on the regulatory side of things, or on the incentive side of things, or all three. Uh, so uh, we're here to we're here to try to help answer some of your uh, questions, and so by all means, use that code uh, and uh, put in your request uh, for some of that assistance. Uh, this has obviously been a very technical uh, presentation in some ways, with lots of information. We will be following up with a, an email with a recording uh, to a uh, link to, uh, to this webinar this week. Um, so look out for that. Uh, feel free to review the presentation and uh, gather any of your questions. And, uh, and again, feel free to uh, use that QR code to bring some of those questions uh, specifically to us. So thank you again for joining us today. Uh, and we will conclude the webinar there. Thank you.